If you're taking notes, God's big idea for you is simply this. If you weren't here last week, go listen to the message online last week. You can download the Antioch app, get all the messages for free. His goal for you, his big idea, number one, very simple but profound if we move into this reality, is for you to become more like Christ and for your environments to become more like heaven. Our goal, our pursuit, our aim is uh, is that we're aligning ourselves to God's will. And as we align ourselves to God's will, we want to discover God's purpose and plan. And God's purpose and plan for us is that, number one, we are conformed, are transformed, we become more like Christ, and then it is not only that we experience personal transformation, but the environments in which we dwell will be transformed through our personal transformation. And the goal is that we become more like Christ and our environments, again, become more like heaven. Now, as I shared with you last week, Wayne Cheney's bootleg definition of heaven. Don't let the word bootleg throw you off. It's bootleg simply because it's from me and not a New Testament scholar. But it's profound in that it's simplistic, and I believe it captures the essence of heaven, particularly when God, when Jesus prays, thy kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He says, get this pattern from heaven to earth. What is heaven? Heaven is an environment absent of opposition to God's will. It is an environment absent of opposition to God's will. We find the moment that Lucifer rears his head and begins to move into, think about moving into opposition to God's will, he is expelled from heaven because heaven has no room for that which opposes the will of God. So if we are to move our environments to become more like heaven, then our goal should be to ensure that we are building and cultivating environments that are not in opposition to the revealed will of God. The more we can do that, the more the environments in which we dwell become like heaven. Now, the why, the why for all of this, if you're taking notes, the why, it's because ultimately this is where everyone wants to be and it's who everyone wants to become. Whether you're saved or not, The reality is there's something innate in you that that calls you deeper. There's a dissatisfaction until you have a life that begins to mirror that of Jesus, that, that carries the joy of Jesus, that carries the peace of Jesus, that carries the alignment to God's will so that there's a sense of wholeness that communes with God because ultimately that's what we're created to do. And we have to reclaim that as the church. We don't have to be apologetic when we share our faith or share what's transformed our lives with others because ultimately, deep down, that's who everyone wants to become. Whether they name the name of Jesus or not, innately they were created to live a life like Jesus. The closer they get to that reality, the more fulfillment comes to their life. You have to know what you carry. That's why I'm not apologetic about sharing my faith. I'm not apologetic about what's transformed me in, in revealing that to others because ultimately it's what they really want to become. And then secondly, every environment that we find ourselves in, ultimately, listen, people, it's where people, an environment that's consistent with heaven or the will of God is ultimately where people want to be. It's our brokenness, it's our need, it's our misplaced desire that drive us into other environments. But even in those environments, they don't truly satisfy. I can't think of the last time someone dropped it like it was hot and it just brought joy to their heart. Whatever the desire is, whether, whether they dropped it like it's hot, men went home to finish the deed with somebody. Though their desires drove them there, in, while they're in that environment, the reality is it does not satisfy the same way an environment that's consistent with the will of God satisfies. So we must understand that God wants us to become more like Christ. He wants our environments to become more like heaven because ultimately, listen to me, if we can do this, if we can build this, it will create a magnetism that people, listen, we, we, would, we would have to build new buildings. Your houses would be full. Your neighbors would cram their way into where you are. Whether you're eloquent or not, you don't have to be eloquent. You don't have to be a mastermind, but ultimately you have what everyone intrinsically really desires deep down in their heart, a life more like Christ, an atmosphere more like heaven. It's where everyone wants to be, and it's who everyone wants to become. That's the why. God's big idea. Today, here's what we'll look at just quickly. While 
it, it sounds easy to just say, hey, we want to be more like Christ. Sounds good. But when you really begin to try to quantify that, how do I become like Christ? How do I develop myself in Christ's likeness? Am I working toward that? Because the reality is, if I don't have a plan to develop myself toward Christ's likeness, the reality is I'm going to hit my mark every time. And that's nowhere. If, again, I don't have my sights or I don't have a pl- set on Christ or I do not have a plan to arrive at that, 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 that place, often I'll hit my mark. And so how, how, how do we begin to do that? It sounds good to leave a church service and, and say, let's become more like Christ. Let's be like Jesus. What would Jesus do? But the question is, how do we become like Jesus? Now, I'm going to apologize ahead of time because... This is kind of like taking on this task. It's kind of like eating an entire gray whale with one chopstick. Our utensils, in many respects, are limited when you consider the, the full scope of Christ's life. We observe life and we observe his words, we observe his deeds, we observe his thoughts. But then we observe the, the internal drivers that, that made him who he was. And then he tells us to follow him in that pattern. It's it's not an easy task to lay it all out because ultimately, on one hand, it can be defined or described or explained or a pattern can emerge. But, But however mature you are, this is still a lifelong journey. So my goal is not to put a pretty ribbon on this and give you a definition to follow or a few things that you should incorporate into your life that you'll be fine with for the rest of your life, but it is, this is the entree. It is the open door to invite you into a life of pursuing Christ with everything that you are. Yeah. And so with that said, we're going on a journey to discover God's big idea for our lives and to fulfill that. Here we go. We say be like Christ, but what does it look like to become like Christ? I submit to you two things, and this is all we're going to deal with today. Number one, God has a role to play in this process. And then we have a role to play in this process to look more like Christ. Here's God's part. Romans 8, 28 through 29. Listen to what it says. And we know that God causes all things to work together for the good of them who love him and are called according to his purpose. Verse number 29. For those he foreknown, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, that he may be the firstborn amongst many brothers and sisters. So here's what he says. He says, God causes all things to work together for the good. Now, here's how he does it. Because often we, we, we misquote this or we put the emphasis in the wrong place. There are doctrines that have emerged from this, Arminianism versus Calvinism, and there are people that are arguing about uh, uh, predestination as it relates to salvation. But this scripture here is not even dealing with predestination for salvation. There are whole bodies of people that are arguing using this scripture and not looking at the emphasis of this scripture. This scripture gives us God's big idea for your life before you were ever here. I love this. Because often we think God is reacting to somehow reacting to to what he's experiencing at this present moment as if we caught God off guard by our life, by our pattern. But here's what the, the Bible shows us. It shows us that he's causing all things to work together for good. What is that good that he's working toward? He says, you were foreknown and predestined to become conformed into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. So here's what he says. The end goal of God. In game, his goal, his vision, his plan for your life, listen to me, was to become conformed into the image of his son, to look like Jesus. I know we have visions. I know we have goals. I know we have dreams. I know we want to be better people. But ultimately, listen to me, what is your goal and how does that align to God's goal and will? Because God's goal and will is that you look more like Jesus. And so if you're praying for money, but money will not strengthen your character, but money will take you further away from your character, further away from dependence on God, then your money will work against God's purpose, and there's no prayer I can pray for you. God, I wish I had time to work this. To give you more money. 
Because ultimately God's, ultimately God's goal, it is for you to prosper. It is for you to have resource. It is for you to have what you need. But God will not violate his ultimate big idea. And his ultimate big idea is for you to become more like Christ. And if becoming, re- receiving more resource makes you less like Christ than more like Christ, then God will not bless you with, with, with that which takes you away from his original plan for your life. But this is why I'm starting from God's big idea. Because if we do this first, notice the words, seek first. Yeah. He says all these things will be added unto you. In other words, he says you prioritize from my plans forward. You prioritize from my ideas, my concepts, my desires from you forward. If you want to understand how to, how, how, to, how to progress in God's kingdom, if you want to understand how to increase in resource and increase in favor, it makes sense to start with God's idea for you. And here's his idea, that you look more like Christ. The Bible says he predestined for, for, uh, for knew you and he predestined you, that which took place before you ever showed up on the scene. If anybody in this place feels as if you've fallen between the cracks or God no longer has you in mind, listen to me. You can praise God for what he had in mind before you ever were. You are, there is never a moment, number one, that you fall between the cracks because the Bible says the hair on your head still numbered. He still collects every tear that you cry. He keeps his eye on you more than every single sparrow, and he has his eye on these worthless sparrows. So how much more... Is he fixed on you as your shepherd, as your comforter, as your father, as your redeemer, as your savior? How much more is he focused on you? You've never fallen off the radar with God no matter how you feel. But in the event you feel as if God does not have you on his radar now, please understand before you ever were, he foreknew you. He knew everything you would be, knew everything that would be in you before you ever were, before the foundations of the world were laid. The Bible says he foreknew you, but he also predestined you. He destined where you would go, destined who you would become, listen to me, before you ever were. So he foreknew you and predestined you before you ever were. Why get frustrated at any point in your path now? Because wherever you are in your path now, he saw it before you ever were. Look at at your neighbor, tell him, low five your neighbor and tell him, he's talking about me. Yeah, we're not not preaching, we're just teaching. If we're preaching, I'll say high five your neighbor. But we're just talking, so low five your neighbor. Listen to me, listen to me. It says, so what was the plan of God before you were? That you may be conformed, I love it, to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Now, this is God's part still. Let's get through this. So, so, so. How does God do that? What does he do? Number one, he conforms us by loving us. Now, I know that, you know, this is why I lose most people's attention when I talk about the love of God. Because most people just make it mushy and, you know, and don't show how it relates or applies to us. But he says he he conforms us by, by, listen, he conforms by loving us. He makes us more like Christ by loving us. And the reason I say this is because most people assume that the only way to become like Christ is God beating us up. God waiting to judge us. And and for many of us, we've lost fulfillment in our relationship with God because we're constantly waiting for a thunderbolt to come from heaven or for for, for him to pay us back for, you know, for what we did. When you were dating, you know, you had some bad relationships and you did some things you shouldn't have done. Now you have daughters and sons and and, and now you think the same thing's going to happen to them because of what you did. And there's this misery in your walk with God as if God is just waiting to judge you or waiting to pay you back for, for all the wrong that you have done. But please understand. Man. He covered the mistakes that you made in Christ. Doesn't mean you don't reconcile. Doesn't mean you don't get it right. That's part of the healing process. But the reality is God's not waiting to wipe you off the face of the earth from a mistake you made 10 years ago. Listen to me. It is the love of God that he first presents before anything else. Now, I want you to hear this. The love of God is what we really got to come into terms with because many of us deal with God like we deal or we project onto God our human relationships. 
So if we're rejected by a father, our father wasn't there, he walked away from us, it's hard for us to understand that God is a good father. Or if we were abused in relationship and we couldn't trust anybody, we think the moment that, uh, that, 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 that God is unworthy or not consistent. We don't mean to, but we project our human relationships on God. If, if we made mistakes in our household and there was no grace from our fathers, our mothers, our aunties, our cousins, we got whooped before we did anything. You ever known any kids like that? One of my mom's friends used to whip, their, whip, whip her kids before they did anything. We said, why are you whipping the kids? He said, because he was getting ready to do something. <laughs> and I remember having a heart-to-heart with her my mom. I was listening. I was ear hustling as a child. And she would have, was having a heart-to-heart with this lady. And she said, why do you do that? She said, he said, she said deep down, she said, because he, he has bad blood. In other words, his dad was messed up. So she's punishing him for ensuring, trying to make sure he doesn't become his dad. And she said, it's nothing that he's done. It's not the way I, I raise him. It's just that internally he has bad blood. His father's blood is running through his veins. That's why I punish him like I do, to make sure he doesn't become his father. Now, could you imagine growing up like that? When you grow up like that, you begin to project onto God your human encounter, your human relationship. But please understand, we don't start with our human encounter or relationship because God's love and his dealing with us always supersedes our human relationship. We don't project our human relationship and our human flaws onto God, but we allow God from heaven to tell us how much he loves us, to tell us how much he desires to be with us, to tell us now we've been made worthy in Christ Jesus, to tell us that we don't have to tiptoe into his presence, but that we can boldly go into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy. Your parent may have made you knock at the door and cuss you out when you walk in, but I will never cuss you out. You can come into my presence. I'm not waiting to wipe you off the face of the earth because I love you. The Bible says, the Bible says, listen, it is the goodness in the same book, Romans second chapter said it is the goodness of God. It is not the wrath of God that brings men to repentance. Initially, it is the goodness of God. The goodness. Some of us are burnt out in, in our walk with God, and God never, he never, he never designed for us to be burnt out. But most of us are burned out with our walk with God. This is why theology is always important. I know we just want to get to self-help in this day and age, but it's important to establish a foundation of theology so that we understand how God thinks toward us, how God works. Are you with me? Because if we don't understand that, it can always be manipulated. But if we understand, no matter where we are, that theology, his word is established, the way he views us is established. His, the thoughts that he has toward us are established. Listen to me. We're not tossed about every time a teaching or our feelings violate the will of God. That's why you need to get in Bible study too. Yeah. Don't just come or find inspiration. You need to know God's word. Because listen to me, it's the goodness of God. Wasn't his love first? God so loved that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Before he ever set anything in motion in your life or your journey, he first gave you his son and demonstrates his love for you. Then in Romans it says it is the goodness of God that brings men to repentance. When you, even when you're crazy, even when you've been ratchet and wretched, even when you know you dropped the ball, you know you've made mistakes, you know you deserve to be wiped out. You know, that's a good place to shout. When you know you should have been wiped out. But God, listen to me, but God's, but when you think about the goodness of God, see some of you when I said, when you think of, when I think of the goodness of God and all he's done for me, you thought that was just a, a place to shout. You thought that was just a, a preachy thing that church people say or pastors say, they're going to rise of the crowd. Listen, I don't need a rise from you. But that is a true statement reflected in my life. That is the meditation of my heart. I cannot think about the goodness of God without also thinking about if it had not been for the goodness of God, where I would end up, where I would have been. We haven't got to my eternal destination yet. We're just talking about the mess I would be in in life if it had not been for the love, the kindness, and the goodness of God. Sometimes it's that that prompts me back to loving him because who wouldn't want to serve a God that gave you another chance? Who wouldn't want to serve a God that gave you the best that he had to give to save you and to transform you? It is the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. 
But there's a flip side of that coin. Here's the flip side of that coin. Uh, when the goodness doesn't lead you to repentance. <laughs> this is what they won't preach on TV. Uh, what do you do when the goodness doesn't lead you to repentance? The Bible says, number one, he does it through love. He conforms us to the image of Christ through love. The second thing is he does it through, uh-oh, here it is, cuss word in the church, through discipline. Mm-hmm. Yes. You thought once you got out of your mother's house, it was done. Once you were grown, got out of your daddy's house, got your own place, you were done getting whoopings. But interestingly, God does not start with a whooping. He woos you with the love. But then when the love does not bring about transformation or move us closer to the image of Christ, then he brings about his discipline. Hebrews says, Hebrews 12, um, 4, uh, uh, 4 through 6 says, you have not yet resisted. He's, now, these are believers that have found themselves wrestling with, with deep sin. He said, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. And you have forgotten. You've forgotten. you become for, forgetful. You think you could just be out there wiling out? See, any, <laughs> anytime you're out there, just, you just, just a little too turnt. It's because you have spiritual amnesia. You, you've forgotten that you're somebody's child. Now, people with no accountability can go out, stay out as long as they want to, don't have to worry about street lights. But when you're somebody's child, <laughs> okay, I will. When you're somebody's child, Listen to me. And you represent them. Yes. There are two way reasons your parents discipline you. The, the first reason they discipline you is because they want it to go well with you ultimately. Yes. That's right. That's right. They, they don't want you to get caught up. They don't want you to lose life. Sometimes they withhold things from you or they discipline you because ultimately they want it to go well with you at the end. But the other reason that they discipline you is because you represent them. It's because you have their name on you. Your last name is Cheney. Your last name is Davis. Your last name is Anderson. Your last name is Rivers. Are you with me? And when you go out into public and you act a fool, you don't just dishonor yourself, but you dishonor the name that's attached to you. So sometimes I have to discipline you to shift you back to acting like we act in this household. But not just in this household, when you leave this household and you're out in public, so next time they see you, they say, that's how a Cheney's supposed to act. That's how Anderson's supposed to act. But there's something greater, listen to me, in your relationship with God. It is not just a noble last name that you have. No matter what your family name is, no matter how crazy your family pooking them were, are you with me? It is God's name who's on you. And when you stand and claim the name of Christ, God says, I'm not going to let you be out there acting a fool forever because my name is on you. I, I don't know who I'm talking to. I don't know. No, no five your neighbor. Tell him his name's on you. Name's on you. Name's on you. The Bible says if his name's on you, he disciplines you as those that he loves. He disciplines you like a son. He says, now watch the contrary. He said, if you weren't a son, I didn't discipline you or you would be a bastard. He said, and there are no bastards, God, I feel this, in the body of Christ. He said, but everyone in the body of Christ is a son of the living God, is a daughter of the living God. And if, in fact, you are a son, from time to time, to make sure you're representing the name, I've got to discipline you to bring you back into my plan, back into my design, back into my purpose for you. Look at your neighbor. Tell them, if you don't forget, you won't have to be reminded. God, I feel. <laughs> but thank God he did remind me. Thank God he didn't let me allow me to go too far. Thank God he through circumstance 
drove me back into his presence. Because when I got grown, thought I was big, had it figured out, I said, I know how to walk outside of God's will and still be okay. I know how to walk a tightrope. But after falling off a few times, God will drive you back into the center. Uh, it doesn't feel good. When you go out there and turn up and he turns you down. Has anybody, I know you can turn up, but does anybody know what it is? Is it anybody's testimony that God will turn you down? He'll let you have what you thought you wanted in abundance until you realize I don't want nothing but I don't want anything but Jesus I don't want anything but his will but if he doesn't discipline me from time to time I'm supposed to be lecturing y'all but see here's how you know you've moved into maturity you know you've moved into maturity where you say thank you. When you got spankings as a kid, you said to your parents, or under your, knee, under your breath in your room about your parents, I can't stand them. I hate them. They're so mean. But the older you get, the more you see the way those that didn't have discipline begin to drift. Those that got what they wanted begin to fall off. So you, as a grown man, a grown woman, look back and say, I thank God for a mom that didn't let me go. I thank God for a dad who didn't let me go crazy. Because if you had left me to myself, I would have been all messed up. But I thank them now for the things I cussed at them for back then. The Bible says, all right, good, don't. The Bible says, Bible says, when the Lord disciplines us, we're to remember his love. And to remember when I drift too far. God, I feel that. When I drift too far, he loves me. But then he disciplines me. Back into his will so that I become more like, more like Christ. Number three, how does God conform us? Or how does God transform us? Number three, he does it through revelation. God's part. 2 Corinthians 2, 9 through 10. It says, but just as it is written, things which eyes have not seen and ears have not heard and which have not entered into the hearts of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. It's almost like it's a mystery, but until you get down to verse number 10, it says, but for us, God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. So number one, he conforms us into the image of Christ, makes us look more like Christ through his love. He makes us look more like Christ through his discipline. But then the third thing is he makes us look more like Christ through his revelation. See, most in the church, we have not moved beyond behavior modification. God didn't save you simply for behavior modification. There are disciplined folks from all sorts of religions that abstain from sex. We've made that the end goal in the church. That was not God's end goal for you. There are disciplined people from all religions that don't smoke crack. That is not God's ultimate goal for you. I have a whole list, but I'm going to move on. He removes us from those things, not simply to remove us from those things. He removes the, us for, for those things to empower us to accomplish his will more unhindered and unimpeded by the things that weigh us down. He has a race for us that he wants us to run. But for many of us, the church has stopped at taking off the weight and the sin that so easily besets us, and we are praising God that the weight and the sin is being removed, not realizing that the only reason that he removed the weight and the sin is that we may run the race that is before us. 
that we may live, that we may do the will of God. He frees us now to reveal to us his plans, his purposes, that we may carry them out. God can form us the image of Christ, listen to me, by revelation. That's God's part. God has a role to play. And thank God God has a role to play. He didn't leave me to myself because if he left me to myself to figure this thing out, it would have been like the Old Testament all over again. It would be like being under the law all over again because it would be a standard that is created that I don't have the empowerment to overcome. But thank God that he fills us with his spirit to enable us to accomplish his will, but also that he is at work in loving us, disciplining us, and giving us revelation that we may become more like Christ. Look at your neighbor and tell them you're not alone in this. God has a role to play. Now, I hope I didn't lose your attention. No. I promise you there's no hoop, there's no shot at the end of this. You're not going to run laps, but I'm just going to talk to you for the rest of this. But then there, there is your, a part that you play. Say, I play. I now, here's our work in the process. Now, before we talk about the specific actions or patterns that we need to address, the engine that drove, listen, let's look at the engine that drove Jesus' behavioral patterns. Don't immediately jump into, as most people, when we talk about living like Jesus, we, we begin to jump into the word, deed, and thought of Jesus. So we begin to talk about things like, I just want to speak like Jesus. I want to do deeds like Jesus. I want to think like Jesus. But not, not realizing that we have moved subtly to the second step without observing the first. Wow. We'll talk about this the next Sunday. We'll talk about the two things that precede a life of work, deeds, and thoughts. A words, deeds, and thoughts. There was a, there was a custom from a rabbinic custom. Rabbis would do what they call, you've heard me say this before, before, even before they prayed, there was a custom that preceded their prayer, and it was called, if you take notes, inclining one's heart toward God. So they didn't just jump out of, you know, a crazy situation or the distractions of life and all those things and just say, all right, Lord, today I would like you to, which is okay sometimes. But it was a, a richer experience. At least the pattern was rich because as opposed to jumping just from their everyday mentality into attempting to pray, what they would do is they would begin to incline their heart toward God. They begin to separate the things that distracted them. They would fix their mind on the goodness of God, the, the character of God, his worthiness to be approached which we often take haphazardly. And so by the time they opened up their mouth to pray, there was a unique prep preparation that preceded even their interaction or their conversation with God. I believe with all my heart that before we get into the words and the deeds of Jesus and attempting to, to, to recreate the words and the deeds of Jesus through our life, how did Jesus talk to this lady? That's how I'm going to talk to this lady. That's a good place to start. But, but, but I don't believe that God's ultimate goal was simply for you to observe what Jesus did, and I'm going to prove this by the end, and just duplicate what Jesus did, I believe it was for you to adopt the entire engine that drove all of Jesus' behavioral patterns. Okay, all right, let's go a little deeper. If God gives revelation and direction, in a general sense, we access that in a greater way through, write this down, communion. Communion. Not the wafer and the wine or grape juice, but in the posture or nature of our relationship to God. I told you about the, the exercise I was challenged to, challenged to, you've heard it several times at Oxford, summer, the summer course there at the Kings. There was a lecture, and Bishop Omer really gave a character study of the life of Jesus and gave us a way to look at the character study of the life of Jesus. And one of the things he said was, a good exercise is to try to determine how much Jesus did in his divinity, how much he did in his humanity, and then how much he did in his anointed humanity. Because all those are good observations. Now, I told you, you need some theology, so be rooted. Don't look at me like you want your house and car. <laughs> and your miracle blessings on the way, stick with me. In Jesus' divinity, where he's modeling himself in many respects as God. He, there, 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 there are incremental times where Jesus does that. He allows himself to be worshipped. Whenever Jesus is allowing himself to be worshipped, he's not doing it as a man, but he's doing it as 
God in the flesh. But then there are times where Jesus is seen simply in his humanity as we study his character. In his humanity, he, he ate, he drank, even though it was prophetic symbolism. He said, I thirst. There, there, there are practical things. Jesus did not leave this live this life as docetism and serenthanism would suggest and have some otherly body. He had a human body because if he did not come in a human body, he could not save humanity. He had become the, 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 the firstborn of many, amongst many brethren. And so in, in his humanity, he, he ate, he drank, he thirsted. In his anointed humanity, however, he declares the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And it's in his anointed humanity that he is not only demonstrating himself as God or simply demonstrating himself as human, but he's demonstrating what it is to be a divinely inspired human. And this was the goal of God, the Christ, that we are to follow him into. Whenever Christ is modeling his anointed humanity is setting up a pattern for us to follow. He said the worshipers that God seek, must, uh, is looking for will worship him in spirit and in truth. He marries both those things, sets up a pattern as he embodies both those things for us to follow him into. And here we go, we're done. So then the question is, if we're going to be like Jesus, what drove Jesus? Let's look at the scriptures really quickly. John 5, 19. It says, therefore, Jesus answered them, saying, truly, truly, I say to you, the Son of Man can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. Listen to John 5, 30. I can do nothing, nothing. I can do nothing. Jesus. On my own initiative, as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. John 6, 38, for I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. John 8, 28 to 29. So Jesus said, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he and I do not do anything on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father has taught me and he who has sent me is with me. He has not left me alone for I always, say always, always. I always do the things that are pleasing to him. John 12, 49 through 50, it says, for I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. John 14, 10. Do you not believe that I am the Father and the Father is in me? The word that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. John 14, 10. Now listen to me. Look up at me. Jesus says, and we're wrapping with this. Listen. He says that everything you see me produce was not on my own initiative accord or according to my own will. We see the culmination of this, the zenith of this, as he gets ready to go to the cross. And he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. He says, Lord, may this cup that you desire for me, may it pass from me. But almost in the same flow, in the same sentence, he says, but nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Even when it's the hardest thing, he says, I am submitted to you. I desire to do your will. But here's where all of his actions came from. They came out of communion and intimacy with the Father. In fact, he indicts the, the, the religious leaders of the time who had learned just to read scriptures without actually relating to the author of those scriptures. He says, that you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have life, as opposed to coming to me that you may have life. And I tell you, if we want to be like Jesus, if we have any hopes of being conformed to the image of Jesus, we need to have the pattern that is revealed in scriptures that we can clearly see where we drift because our own feelings will lead us astray. But here is the deal. 
It is not good enough to simply look at what Jesus did and try to repeat what Jesus did. That's part of it. But the deeper pattern of God is to adopt the engine that drove the behavioral patterns of Jesus. And that is that all of my doing comes out of communion with the Father. This is not a task list, a checklist, a list of, list of things to do that is divorced from relationship with God. But here is the picture. As he could, everything that he did, he said, came out of hearing from the Father. Everything that he did came out of seeing the pattern that the Father had. What he was trying to reveal to us is that my my works are flowing out of my intimate connection, my communion with God. If we have any hopes of modeling the pattern that Jesus laid before, laid before us, we have to do it by first communing with God. We see this pattern of Jesus ministering before the crowd. But listen to me. He did not just heal, detach from God. He did not just speak, detach from the Father. But we see this seamless flow of him ministering to the people. He did not do that around the clock. But then he would go to the Mount of Olives, the Bible said, as was his custom. What was he doing at the Mount of Olives? What was he doing even as he was engaged in healing people? He went there to hear from his father, to commune with his father. He comes out of that place and stays full of his father's directives, both in the city and on the mountaintop. Are you still here with me? He says, everything I do is birthed out of that place of communion with the father. We have no hopes of accomplishing the will of God and the purpose of God for our life if it does not come out of communion with our Heavenly Father. That was the engine that drove the behavioral patterns of Jesus. Now, you cannot add value to the crowd if you're always amongst the crowd. You cannot make your environment more reflective of heaven if your devotion is grounded to the earth. How do I get the pattern? How do I hear in a fresh way from God without communing with him? It's there that I receive his plans, his revelation, along with reading his word, which shows me if I'm drifting, which shows me as the plumb line, if, if what I'm doing, believing, practicing is consistent with what God has already revealed through scripture. But it's out of communion with God. Last passage. Matthew 7, 21 through 23, and I'm closing with this. Listen to his words. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But notice this. He who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Now listen to what he says. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not, listen, prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons? And in your name, listen to me, perform miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never do you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now, here's the, here's the revelation there, and I'm done. He says, not everyone will enter, but those that do the will of my Father. Now, here's what confused me. Because we see him doing the will of his Father, and doing the will of his Father, he prophesied. Doing the will of his Father, he casted out demons. Doing the will of his Father, listen to me, he did miracles. And it's not only applied, these the, the supernatural things apply, but it's almost like he says, uses these as an example because everything else falls under the category. So you can add to this, did we not teach in your name? Did we not serve in your name? Did we not speak in a tongue in your name? Listen to me. And he says, depart from me. Crazy. You work of iniquity, I never do you. They're doing the same thing Jesus did. Yet, he says, depart. I never knew you. I submit to you that the revelation, as we go forward, an attempt to live a life that Jesus called us to live, to become more like him. This passage reveals that it is not just doing the things we saw him did, do 
that make us more like him. Because these people did the things that he did. And the father did not say that is just like my son. But rather he says, depart. Which means, and I, I don't know why the church hasn't got this. That we don't just skim the scriptures and say, how did Jesus do it? That's what I'm going to do. He said, depart from me. Why? Because I never knew you. This word know is not that there was somehow knowledge concerning who you were that was obscured or out of the sight of God. He is omniscient. He is all seeing. He knows you're in from the beginning. He knows the Bible says your thoughts from afar. This has nothing to do with whether he knows you or not. But this word know is the idea it is, a, it, is, it is traced back to the idea when the Bible says, and Adam knew his wife Eve. He wasn't saying he understood him, but he said, Adam became, how can I put this? Adam became intimate with his wife Eve. Adam became of one flesh with his wife Eve. Adam deposited, God, I wish I had time, the life that was in himself. God, I thought I was. Into his wife Eve. So when the Bible declares that you are to part because you never knew me, the flips that, that what is implied is that you're doing all the things my son did, but not doing it the way my son did it. And God sent me on assignment to declare he doesn't want us just to become like Jesus externally, but he wants us to adopt the engine that drove the behavioral patterns of Jesus. And what drove the actions of Jesus was intimacy and communion, walking and talking and relating to and seeking the will of the Father. And out of that, he began to do things that confounded people's minds. Out of that, he began to teach with authority most didn't have. Because while they read the book, he knew the author. And so when he stood and said, there's authority that exuded from him. God says, I'm making you more like Christ. My big idea for you is to make you look more like Christ. Every day of your life, I have a role to play, and I'm going to play my role. I'm going to love you. I'm going to discipline you, and I'm going to give you revelation. But in order to tap into my revelation, in order to understand my daily plans for your life, he says, you've got to move into communion with me. Because if you observe all that Jesus did without observing what Jesus did to do what Jesus did, then you've missed it all together. But if you are to be, listen, if you are to be in the number of folks that extend my grace, if you're to be in the number of folks that are conformed to the image of Christ and then also transform their environment into that which is more like heaven. He says it starts with communing with me. May we reclaim that mandate. May it not just be mental theology, but may there be experiential encounter. May we reclaim that mandate. May there be a hunger and thirst that is poured out in this place over the lives of people. God, I pray that you remove complacency. I pray that you remove distraction. I pray that you remove those things that hinder us from being who you've called us to be. Those things that hold us back. I pray that you rip off sin and the weights that so easily beset us that we may run. But I pray that you give us revelation of all that you have before us. I pray for your people, Father God, that they would know your plans for them, your plans to prosper them, your plans to be glorified through them, your plans to, to transform environments that people have thrown their hands up and walked away from. Lord, we simply ask, in a nutshell, that your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and we'll give you glory for it. You honor, we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. All those who are here with the prayer, let me hear you shout, Amen.